afternoon, everybody. We'll get started in just a couple of minutes. Paul, good afternoon to you. How are you doing? I'm doing great, Sean. Thanks for having me. You're very welcome. It's good to have you here. And give people a couple of minutes to jump in and we'll get started. Yeah, absolutely. Well, we got a couple of people rifling in. Just another minute, Paul, and we'll we'll get things going here. Not a problem. How's the weather in Colorado today? Incredibly hot. Yeah, it's funny. I'm in I'm in Nova Scotia, which is home for me, and um, I don't live here anymore. But I'm home for the month, and it's the first day of sun that I've seen since I've been here in a week and a half. <laughs> so it's it's very nice. It's not hot, but um, it's nice to see the sun finally. Yeah, we've had uh, two phases of weather this summer. It's either rain or it's incredibly hot, and that's it. So those are your only options right yeah. now. Right on. Well, we're one minute after the start time, Paul. So let's let's go ahead and get this thing kicked off. Um, thanks so much, everybody, for coming. Um, excited to introduce everybody to Paul. Um, we're going to talk about axing the non-compete and other useful tips when you're out there seeking new employment. Um, I got to know Paul several years ago. Uh, Paul's an interesting guy, uh, visionary founder and CEO of a company called Offer First, um, and also a really diverse and interesting background. Uh, has done recruiting for one of the largest um, veterinary organizations in, in the United States, uh, also has a background in the U.S. Marine Corps, and uh, just an all-around interesting, passionate guy that's driven to make some change in this world of veterinary medicine. And Paul, with that, I'm going to hand things over to you and let you take, take care of it. Um, just a few kind of housekeeping notes. Feel free to ask questions as we're going through the presentation. Um, if it's something super burning and interesting and relevant, Paul, I'll, I'll prompt you to answer the question in real time. Otherwise, we'll have some time at the end for questions. Um, I know there's Paul's got a lot of information to share with you guys. So, Paul, over to you. Take it away. Thank you, Sean. Yeah, those um, real-time questions are the best ones. So, please, I have no problem with that interruption. Just let me know. Folks, um, first of all, thank you for sharing some of your time with me today. Um, we're going to go over a few topics. First, of course, is going to be a brief introduction. Um, and I wanted to explain how I started with this uh, non-compete advocacy. After that, we're going to dive into some contractual clauses that you need to be aware of. And I'm going to show you specific um, snapshots or screenshots of those contractual clauses to help you um, identify them in your own contracts. After that, we're gonna talk about five items that you should seriously consider when you're searching for a job. And then I'm gonna wrap it up with my ask of you, and then I'll open the floor up for some questions if there are any here at the end, all right? So let me just go ahead and share my screen. All right, so like Sean said, I am a uh, Marine Corps veteran, did uh, two tours over in Kuwait, um, stationed over in Camp Pendleton my entire time. And it was an experience that clearly I'll never forget. And it's something that kind of formed the person and the leader that I became today. Um, I am also the founder and CEO of Offer First. Offer First is a new uh, recruiting technology company launching later this year, which is intended to change the way employers and candidates engage. And I'm giving it away in the name, Offer First. So if you want to learn more about that, you can go over to our website, OfferFirst.com, and check it out there. Um, I am a recruiting industry expert. I've spent over 21 years leading various recruiting teams in several different industries, most recently of which was um, veterinary medicine, where I led one of the nation's largest veterinary employers to 1,120 DVM hires in just two years. And of course, I'm also the leading advocate for ending the veterinary non-compete. And with that, what I wanna do is tell you a little bit about how that advocacy to end the non-compete started. Um, if you're on LinkedIn, if you're following me on LinkedIn, you may have seen this article I've written titled uh, Suffer in Silence. 
This article was written about a specific veterinarian who came to me for help when she felt as if she had nowhere else to go. Now, this was a young veterinarian who I think she, at the time she had about two, maybe three years of experience. This was the first job she had taken out of um, veterinary school. And just like many other veterinarians, she was so excited about this first job. Um, the interview experience was just incredible. They rolled out the red carpet for her. Um, all kinds of great promises, right? Like uh, mentorship and, a, and an, a flexible work schedule and the ability to, to sit in on some challenging cases, things that she was just overly excited about. Well, she started the job and about, you know, a year or so into it, she started realizing, well, hey, you know, none of these promises that were made were being kept. And the more she asked about those, the worse she was being treated, okay? And it finally got to a point where the practice owner blatantly said to her, look, you're free to leave if you want to, just remember that you signed a non-compete. And that reminder was something that she hadn't really even thought of. You know, like many other veterinarians, she just signed that contract because she was excited to get a job, didn't really understand exactly what she was signing until it was already too late. And as she described this work environment to me, um, I had, you know, I, I had no other choice but to just ask her. I said, how are you coping with this? How are you coping with this negative environment on a day-to-day -day basis? And she paused for a second and said to me, she said, well, Paul, I go to work and do the very best I can for, to, to, to care for my patients while just suffering in silence. And that's how I got the title of this article. And that, that was the exact moment that I knew that I had to do something about this because I knew that there were there's so many other veterinarians out her like out there like her who were stuck in these toxic work environments and had no choice but to either continue doing that work or not working at all because that non-compete prevented them from attaining another position. So that's how it all got started. And with that, what I'm going to do now is dive into some of these contractual clauses that you need to be aware of, okay? And the first one is probably one of the most popular. It's called the clawback agreement. Now the clawback agreement is something you're going to see in a contract if you get any type of bonuses, right? So the most popular bonus is obviously the signing bonus or the sign on bonus. The other most popular one is the retention bonus. Now what I want you to do is think of the signing bonus as an advance for services not yet performed, okay? And the retention bonus is an advance, or I'm sorry, a payment for services performed, okay? So one is an advance and one is after you perform the service. Now let's dive into what the clawback means. In this, um, in this contractual clause right here, you can see that this individual is gonna receive a $10,000 sign-on bonus. But it says that if the employment period is terminated prior to the one year anniversary, this, this team member would have to repay the signing bonus of the company within 60 days, okay? Now, I don't know about you, but having to come out of pocket $10,000 in just 60 days would be difficult for me, okay? And I think it's gonna be difficult for most veterinarians, especially those that are just starting out. Now, the problem with this is that, again, the sign-on bonus is payment in advance of the services rendered. Well, if you were to resign at 11 months and you sign this contract, you would have to pay back the full $10,000, even though you gave them 11 months of service, okay? The other fact is, is that when you get that $10,000, you're probably only gonna see about 6,000, maybe 6,500 in your pocket. Well, when you have to pay it back, you're paying back the full 10, and then you have to adjust your taxes later on after the fact, which is another whole nightmare to deal with, okay? So when I see contractual clauses like this, or when I'm working with a candidate who I'm trying to help with a job, I would never let them sign an agreement like this, okay? What I will push for, or what I ask them to counter for, is called a prorated clawback agreement. Now the prorated clawback agreement takes that $10,000, divides it by 12, okay? And then whatever is remaining is what you pay back. So for example, $10,000 sign-on bonus, you quit at 11 months. Well, you only owe one twelfth of that bonus, which is about $800. And that's a much easier pill to swallow. 
Okay. So folks, if you are getting any kind of sign-on bonus, you need to double check your contract for this fallback agreement. And if it is not prorated, you need to counter that. And if they will not prorate it at all, you need to seriously consider whether or not this is a job you wanna take. Now the retention bonus, what I'm about to show you here is something that I've seen, I've seen it several times, but I can't say that I've seen it regularly. But that for you, is, it shouldn't be important. You should be checking every single aspect of this contract, all right? Now, remember the retention bonus is a payment after services have been rendered. So for example, most retention bonuses will say something like, hey, if you stay for two years, we'll give you $10,000, all right? In this example, this doctor was going to get a $10,000 bonus starting at year two through six for a total of $50,000. So they were gonna give $10,000 each year starting at year two, all right? And if you notice this last sentence, it says if the employment is terminated within one year of any retention bonus payment, the associate shall be required to repay the bonus within 30 days of separation. So even more aggressive than the first example. Now, here's the thing about this. This is one I would never let anybody sign again. You have already met the commitment, all right? If the retention bonus is a payment after two years and you stayed there for two years, you have earned that money. There should be no repayment clause at all. So if you see a clawback agreement on a retention bonus, that's a red flag. You need to get that stricken from your contract because you've already held up your end of the deal, okay? Now, it's also important that you're aware of the dates on these types of things, okay? So you need to know when your retention bonuses are going to be paid out. For example, let's say, let's say it's not the best fit for you, all right? Let's say you're at about, uh, I don't know, 23 months, 22 months there, right? And at the 24th month, that retention bonus is gonna hit. But you already know this isn't gonna be an employer that you're gonna stay with long-term. Now that you remember that, hey, you know what? In two months, I'm gonna get this bonus. You could start looking for that job. Just don't accept it until after that bonus is paid, okay? So what I've seen many professionals do is they will wait until that retention bonus is paid, then start their new job and get that sign-on bonus. It's called double dipping and there's absolutely nothing wrong with it. You all deserve it, okay? You held up your end of the deal and that was your only obligation. Okay, so please make sure you understand the terms of any payment that is being made to you and specifically look for the clawback agreement. If you see one on the signing bonus, make sure it's prorated. If you see one on the retention bonus, get it eliminated. Okay, the next item is going to be, it's not necessarily a contractual clause, but ambiguous terms are things that you are going to find throughout a contract. And one of the most ambiguous terms or the most um, repeatedly used ambiguous terms that I found is this word right here, indirectly. Employers use the term indirectly in your employment contract to cast a broad net on just about any and every possible thing you can do and that others can do that affect you. And that's right, somebody else can do something that results in this clause being um, initiated against you because it was an indirect initiation, all right? Here's an example of that. You take a new job and that new job at whatever hospital starts promoting your attendance there or your employment there, right? And that community starts rallying around and maybe some of those uh, candidates, or I'm sorry, candidates, some of those clients from your previous employer they see that, that you're at this new employer's um, hospital and they start coming with you. Well, that can, that can be considered an indirect solicitation. And here's the thing, every employer does it. But if you sign this, that one employer can, it's, can essentially hold you accountable for it, okay? So when you see ambiguous terms, you need to do one of two things, get them defined or get them stricken, okay? Now, if an employer cannot define a term in a contract that they provided to you, then it doesn't need to be there. Now, when they do define it, let's assuming they do, you need to understand that definition and you need to be okay with it. And if you're not, 
you need to either get it stricken or revised, okay? But the bottom line is, is that you cannot, you should not sign any type of contract, especially an employment contract, if there are terms contained in it that you do not clearly understand or that are not clearly defined. This word indirectly is one that gets me every time because I've seen it in every single contract I've reviewed, okay? Now, another one of these types of items are one-sided terms, all okay? right? So we've got the ambiguous terms and now we've got one-sided terms. And the difference here is that the employment relationship is one that is intended to be mutually beneficial. You're providing a service, they pay for that service. It's relatively basic. But when I start seeing contractual clauses that are one-sided, that raises red flags in my mind, all right? And here's one of the most popular ones, the non-disparagement clause. Throughout this paragraph, I'm not gonna read the whole thing, but you can see where I highlighted, employees shall not. And then it goes into a list of things that the employees shall not do. The thing about it is nowhere in this contract does it say that the employer shall not do these things. And that is not a mutually beneficial arrangement, okay? So when you see these types of one-sided um, contractual clauses that are not beneficial to you, again, either ask for it to be stricken or ask that it be made mutually beneficial. And in this case, it should say the employee and employer shall not, right? And some of you may be wondering, well, when is an employer ever going to disparage me, right? Um, I'll tell you, during your references, okay? Um, that's the easiest opportunity for them to do it. Most employers will just stick to the standard, um, you know, dates of employment and rehire eligibility. But when they do that, if that's the only feedback they give to somebody looking for a reference, that's kind of a red flag, right? So you need to make sure that the one-sided terms don't exist in your contract, all right? If it's okay for them, then it should be okay for you and vice versa. Now, the next one is a little more subtle, all right? This is one that is normally found at the very, very end of the contract, those pages that most people just gloss over, right? Because it's uh, usually like the boiler plate uh, section, but it is a very important um, contractual clause in that successors and assigned section indicates what the employer can do with your contract. All right. What I mean by that specifically in this example is that if the employer decides to sell their hospital and you sign this contract, this clause indicates that they can transfer ownership of that contract and its commitments to the new employer. Now, this is relatively standard. I've seen this in every contract, but just because it's standard doesn't make it right. And here's the problem with this clause. Let's say you were working for one of the major corporations, veterinary corporations, right? And you had a horrible experience with them, right? Maybe it was a bad work environment, whatever the case was. You got a new job and told yourself, I'm never working for corporate again, okay? You go to this private practice, they hire you, everything's great. A few years down the road, that owner tells you, hey, I'm selling my practice. And the buyer is that employer you used to work for. Well, if you sign this, they now own you again, okay? Now, the thing about this paragraph is that most probably won't strike it, but you can get it edited. This is going to tie into your termination clause. Most contracts have a clause, a termination clause, which indicates the period of time you have to give the employer if you wanna resign. Generally, what I've seen out there is about 60 days. What I've done for many of my candidates in this successors and assigned paragraph is we've added a sentence that says, if this hospital is sold or if my contract is to be transferred to another employer, I reserve the right to resign or terminate my employment immediately. All right? So you don't have to wait the 60 days. All right? So if they are going to sell their hospital to somebody else, you have the right to just up and leave. And that protects you in regard to an employer that you may not want to work for buying the hospital that you're currently working in. All right, now here's the big one, the non-competes, okay? 
For those of you who may not know, a non-compete is nothing more than a mechanism for an employer to control your future opportunities, okay? That is basically it. That is the definition of a non-compete. It is going to prevent you from working at any other hospital within a specified radius of your current hospital for a specified period of time. And here's what normally happens. You go through the screening process. They roll out the red carpet for you, okay? The interview experience, everything is just top notch, okay? You negotiated your offer, then at the very end, you're gonna see this contract, okay? And you have already been influenced by this employer through this incredible hiring experience, okay? You're happy with your offer. You're happy with everybody you met. Everything's going good. You get to this non-compete section and in your mind, oh, this place is so great. This is never gonna be an issue for me. I don't care, I'm signing. And then a couple of years down the road, you realize that that honeymoon period is over and things aren't as great as you thought they were. But now you're trapped. Okay, because you signed this non-compete. Another good example is, let's say everything's great. Everything's great at your job. You've been there for, let's say, four or five years, and now you're ready for a leadership position. But your current employer doesn't have one. There's no leadership opportunities there. Their medical director ranks are staffed to the staff to the hill. Your opportunity to become a medical director is years down the road. But guess what? That hospital down the street is hiring a medical director. They're looking to groom a new medical director for their practice because they're growing. And they're offering an incredible salary for this, incredible benefits, and this, this, this awesome work, uh, work schedule, all kinds of great things on top of the fact that you're going to be a medical director. And guess what? Because you sign this, you do not get to take that opportunity. The non-compete enables your previous employer to control your future opportunities. And there is just no reason. I have not been presented with a single reason why a non-compete is beneficial to any employee. I just have not. So folks, I understand that a lot of times we get into these situations where we're looking for that job and God, everything sounds great. Everything seems so perfect. And the, the people are great. They're so nice to you. Um, that it, it creates this perception where you just overlook things like non-competes. You may overlook the clawback agreement because it's never going to happen. I'm always going to be here. Folks, that's just not reality. You need to protect yourself. You do not know what the future holds. But if you sign contracts like these with these aggressive clawback agreements, with non-compete agreements, you prevent yourself from having those other opportunities, okay? Now, what should you do in this, in this position? Number one, do not sign a non-compete, okay? You're gonna hear me say that several times, but just avoid non-competes. What you should do is let it be known upfront, okay? During your initial phone calls with, those, with that employer, you should let them know, hey, I'm not, do you require a non-compete? Because if so, this isn't the opportunity for me, all right? Now, some of you may be thinking, well, gosh, I just really need a job, and I get that. Trust me, I do. But if you're a veterinarian or you're a veterinary professional, period, there's no shortage of jobs out there. Now, yes, I understand the majority of them are going to require a non-compete, but you can find those that will not. And if you don't, if you can't find one, reach out to me. I will help you find one, okay? But the fact is, is that the more people that sign them creates this environment where they are just, they become the norm in the industry. That's where we are today. Once veterinarians stop signing them and employers realize that they can't hire people because of their non-compete, trust me, the non-compete will be nothing more than a memory. But the only way we're going to rid ourselves of this is if you all stand up and refuse to sign it. Make it known that you're not going to sign a non-compete. All right. Now, let's go ahead and move on to the five items you should consider while job searching. The first one's your career goals. OK, if the job doesn't align with your goals, it's going to be a dead end job. So you should be able to clearly articulate what your goals are. What do you want to be doing? What do you want to achieve in the next three to five years? Okay. 
And when you're interviewing with that employer, ask them, how are you going to provide, or I'm sorry, ask them how um, they're going to beat those goals or how they're going to help you accomplish those goals. Ask them to provide you with specific examples as to how they're going to do that, all right? Next is culture. Now, culture is a big buzzword today, all right? You hear it everywhere. Every employer is advertising how great their culture is. And when you interview with them, the recruiters are gonna tell you it's a great culture. When you go on site, the people you meet are gonna tell you how great the culture is. The fact is, is that you should not rely solely on current employees to give you an indication of what that employer's culture is like. What I recommend you do is get on LinkedIn use their search function, their advanced search filters, and look for the one that says past employers, okay? And you can search for people who have been employed, where this employer, the, the person, or I'm sorry, the employer that you're interviewing with, let's say it's ABC Hospital, you can go to LinkedIn and say, I wanna see past employees of ABC Hospital. And you connect with those folks and you tell them that you're considering a job at ABC Hospital and you wanted to talk to them about their experience. Employers with good cultures, with truly good cultures, are the types of employers that people are proud to be from. They're proud to have worked there. So if it truly was a good culture, those past employees will tell you that. But if it wasn't, trust me, they will tell you that as well. And then you use all of that information to formulate an educated decision around whether or not you want to move forward with them, okay? Just do not rely on that first level feedback you get from everybody you talk to who currently works there, okay? The next thing is understanding your role and what your job is going to be, all right? I know that seems relatively simple and basic, but the truth is, is that most people accept jobs without clearly understanding what that job is going to look like long term, okay? So the responsibility should be clear and it should align with your goals and what you want to be doing, all right? You should also ask the employer how those responsibilities are going to evolve as you gain more experience, right? How are they going to keep you challenged, um, you know, years three, four, five, and six? So your role is something, is one thing today, but it should evolve tomorrow. And if the employer can't articulate that, again, that's something that you need to consider um, when you're making that decision, whether or not this is an employer you wanna work for, okay? Next is location. Now, location, the reason I bring this up is because especially if you're a doer veterinarian, your ability to take a job in a broad area, in a broad location, is going to be extremely beneficial to you because it's going to open so many more doors. If you're only focused on a small metropolitan area, well, then obviously your choice is going to be more limited, all right? But if you can broaden your location span, you're going to see that there's going to be so many more opportunities. And if you're able to go to one of those rural areas that are difficult to recruit in, right, you're going to get some incredible experience there. Some of those locations are... Are, are the types that are gonna give you the best mentorship, you're gonna get the best experience and you spend two or three years there, it's gonna open up doors across the country for you, all right? The other thing is, is some of those locations that are hard to recruit for and hard to um, attract talent to, they often pay very, very well, okay? So if you can bite the bullet and, and, and not live in a, in a big city at first, right? Maybe you go to one of those rural locations and you serve that community, you become that community's hero, you're gonna get all kinds of great experience, most likely gonna get incredible pay, right? And when it's time to, to move again, you're gonna have all that under your belt and every door is gonna be open for you, okay? So consider location, um, your location uh, parameters very carefully when looking for a new job, all right? And of course, I had to put the contract in here, okay? What I'm gonna recommend you all do is ask to see the contract before you go to your face-to-face -face interview, okay? There's no sense in wasting your time traveling to an interview, maybe spending a night or two in a hotel room if you're not going to get you know, favorable contractual terms, okay? So if you ask to see a copy of that contract before the interview, you can review it, 
get your questions answered, have a solid understanding of whether or not they're going to prorate the clawback, eliminate ambiguous terms, strike the non-compete, right? You're gonna know all that up front. And if they are willing to do it, great. Go ahead and interview and find out if it's a good fit. If they tell you flat out that they're not going to do it, why bother, why bother interviewing them, okay? So again, ask for these things and there is nothing wrong. If any of you are sitting there saying, gosh, how can I do that? Well, what are they gonna think of me if I do that? Please just get that notion out of your head, okay? Because if anything, if I was on the other side of the table, I would say, well, this doctor is obviously very well educated in employment contracts and they, you know, they wanna make a good educated decision and their personal time is valuable for them, which I know it is. Many of you on this call, I mean, I'm honored that you're spending your personal time with me. But what I'm asking is don't waste it with an employer who's not going to make it a mutually beneficial arrangement to begin with. Because what's gonna end up happening is you're gonna travel there, you're going to be positively influenced by all the great things they do to you throughout that screening process and all the great conversations with people you meet. And then that is going to influence you to sign things you wouldn't normally sign. So get it out of the way before they have the opportunity to influence you in that manner, okay? Now, lastly, I wanted to cover my ask of you. Again, number one, don't sign a non-compete ever. As a matter of fact, I'm asking that you make it known, be public about it. If you're on LinkedIn, I'm gonna ask you to connect with me if you haven't already. Okay, and make it known to employers, put it on your profile, put it on your resume that you will not sign a non-compete. Let people know that you support Paul Diaz and his advocacy to end the non-compete. Okay, the more people that do that, the more attention we'll get and the more these employers will realize that they can no longer hand you these non-mutually beneficial contracts, okay? So the next item is sign and share this non-compete petition. Yes, I started a petition of almost two years ago. It's change.org forward slash and the veterinary non-compete. If you could spare an extra few minutes to go there and sign that um, petition, I would greatly appreciate it. And lastly, folks, organize your colleagues around this effort. I'm sure we've got a small audience today and many of you are connected to so many other veterinary professionals. Connect them to me on LinkedIn, introduce them to me, but, for, but more, more so than that, inform them of the damage a non-compete can do, okay? And get them to rally around this cause. The more people we get to indicate or to say that I'm not signing a non-compete, the quicker the non-compete will end. Once these employers realize that they have to choose between staying in business and having a non-compete, they will end their non-compete, okay? so. With that, I know I've finished just a little bit early, but I see we've got at least one question in the chat. So if there's any other questions at this point, I'll be happy to answer them. I've got a couple of questions here from the audience and feel free to add any others. Uh, one, thanks for your presentation. Um, question from the audience is, um, why Paul Diaz? Um, how do you get down this road of wanting to end the non-compete and why are you so passionate about it? <laughs> why? That's a great question. Well, I'll give you the, the, the honest answer is that I just have such a strong regard and respect for veterinary professionals. And that came from the fact that I have a, a service animal provided to me by the Department of Veteran Affairs. And this dog is, you know what, let me stop sharing my screen so I can look at you guys. My dog is truly just my hero. I mean, I am literally here today because of her. That's, that's her job. And I made that determination a long time ago that anybody, any human who chooses the profession in which they may end up taking care of Stella is somebody that is worth fighting for. And after I heard Sarah's story and I had to sit there and listen to her crying about all she ever wanted to do was be a veterinarian. And now she felt like that job was being taken away from her because she simply just didn't understand this contract. 
that's when I knew I had to do something because nobody else was doing anything about it. So I stepped up. I did it. Um, yes, it, I took a very personal uh, hit, right? So my business, I, I lost 80% of my revenue my first year because my client list went from a couple thousand employers down to double digits in the blink of an eye. The second I decided I would no longer work or support any employer who required one, I lost 80% of my client list, all right? But it was also the best night of sleep I ever had. So to answer that question very specifically, it's because I believe in the mission of veterinary professionals and I applaud them for what they do. And any human that dedicates their life to taking care of animals is somebody that is worth fighting for. And that's what I like to do. I'm a fighter. That's awesome, Paul. We, we've just got a couple of comments in the, in the chat. Uh, thanks so much. Great to hear. Very informative information. Um, and and I think with that, Paul, we're, we're kind of done. We don't have any other questions. We can just do a last call for questions if anybody else has them. Um, but thanks for sharing this information with everybody that showed up today. Um, we'll make the recording available on the Talk To YouTube channel, and uh, we'll share it out to anybody that uh, we can get it to. Excellent. Sean, thank you so much. Danny, I appreciate, uh, appreciate you as well, and everybody who attended today. Again, thank you for spending some of your time with me today. And if, uh, if there's anything I could do for any of you, find me on LinkedIn, or you can email me at paul at offerfirst.com. Thank you so much. Awesome, Paul. Have a great day. Bye, right, everybody. everybody. Thanks for joining. Okay.